I mean, obviously, I, I approached people who I respected, mm-hmm. and I approached people whose, I, I suppose, um, expertise or current interests were aligned with mine. So, obviously, climate change uh, is is very pertinent to the wine industry and incredibly important to me uh, personally. I mean, not not as a winemaker, just generally. Uh, so it it was obviously with your involvement and the fact that you had, you know, been to the Port Porto um, summit and that you had really engaged and grappled with us from a wine industry perspective, you know, made perfect sense. And you know, I think we did have a very brief discussion, and I said, you know, there's a, there's a there's a very loose theme of new trends, but but basically, if you if you can chat about what you want and and i think you said well i can do something on portugal and i said fantastic because portugal of course is an, is another area another wine region which i'm absolutely enamored with and so the two i knew something exciting was going to come from your your piece but the other guys um and girls that i uh, uh women and men that i approached i think uh, i probably knew you less well than most of them I pretty much knew more or less what people were going to talk about. Some got a slightly tighter brief than others. But the whole idea at the end of the day was to uh, also intrigue me. I, I didn't want to, you know, um, lay down the law so that there was nothing exciting yeah, or man. surprising that would come out of it. And you mentioned, you mentioned Portugal as somewhere you're enamored with. And I noticed in your wines, you've got some Portuguese grapes in there. Can you talk just briefly a little bit about... Um, those blends as well. I mean, I, I fell in love with Portugal uh, primarily from a historical perspective. So I was fascinated by uh, the Methuen Treaty. Uh, I studied at university and, uh, and then his son re- redid the Methuen Treaty, which, which um, basically um, left Portugal without uh, a, an industrial, industrial base. Because what what the what the deal did, and I'm sure you know this, Nick, is is that it it ensured that the the product of an in more, uh, a continually industrialized UK were to be imported into Portugal with no or very little um, tax um, mm-hmm. uh, import tax, which would allow and the quid pro quo was of course that the UK or England particularly, um, but, but Scotland was involved as the treaty evolved, um, would, uh, would, would get booze when, they, when <laughs> you guys were fighting the French. So I think it, it intrigued me to, to, from an African perspective, um, to visit a European country that was, for all intents and purposes, non-industrialized yes. uh, compared to the rest of Europe. And to see how that affected both the national psyche but also agriculture, and and of course those those other things are, are, I find so fascinating how how history can can change the way that societies today act and react. Um, so so Portugal, and then of course when I got there and started tasting these wines that have been hidden hidden uh, from us, uh, you know primarily because of the yeah. way that things there have been set up. And I mean you know all hats off to the what the guys um, making fortified wine in Portugal have done and, and how successful they've been over many generations. Uh, but their success has meant, unfortunately, that some of the other re- regions of Portugal, except, of course, up in the northwest, uh, have not really seen the success or the notoriety that they should have. Yeah. And um, there seems to be quite a few, I suppose, there's parallels between Portugal and South Africa, when you talk about the, the history side of it, and also on the winemaking side, I mean, it's, it is such a diverse place, isn't it? I mean, yeah, you've got so much choice in, in what you do with, the, with varieties. Um, yeah, Tariga Franca, uh, Tariga Nacional, yeah. Sinta Barocca. I would plant more Portuguese varieties if they were available. Our farm is, is weirdly actually not that warm. Mm-hmm. Um, but my whole philosophy on, on this farm is to plant varieties that require heat yes. and then make them in a very cool, elegant style. Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm exactly uh, a slightly contrarian view of things. Um, sorry about the big dog there. <laughs> um, I think they must be uh, finding 
porcupines or thing, something. Um, but the, 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 my contrarian perspective is that, you know, I, I love um, elegant red wines. I don't want to have to work hard in the winery at extraction mm -hmm. um, because I think that it's very easy to force wines. I also want to be able to drink robust wines at low alcohol levels. Yes. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I wanted to, to, to make a style of wine on this farm that was unique, not just in South Africa, but in the world. And the easiest way to do that, um, I thought was, uh, while we are at altitude, we 500 meters above sea level, we're very close to the very cold Southern oceans. So we are 45 kilometers, well, 48 kilometers from the Southern oceans. Um, at this altitude means that we are, I mean, we're much cooler than Bordeaux. Uh, average temperatures yep. um, uh, for a ripening season. And we are slightly warmer than Burgundy. So if you can imagine trying to grow Tariga Nacional in Burgundy, uh, the result would be what? Well, it would be fascinating if you can get there. And that's kind of what I wanted to do was to, you know, I mean, I can, I can buy grapes anywhere in the world, right? Yeah, and I'm yeah. already making wine all over the world including Spain, where I have been for, you know, making wine every year for the last 12 years. So, yes. so for me, this, this, this particular farm was about being um, completely out of any com comfort zone that there ever was and to make wines right on the edge of what is possible. I was looking at movable feast. I mean, you've got Tanat, you've got Shiraz, Pinot Noir, Tariga Nacional, Malbec. And yet when I tasted it, it, it was beautifully elegant. And it was it just had a very nice richness to it that you always wanted another sip, which is for me is kind of the, the secret in, in, in Yeah, I call it, I call it the yum yum factor. <laughs> You've got to have the yum factor. Some wines have it, some wines don't. Well, I, I always call it the one, one more sip factor or one more glass factor. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. That's what it is. And I, and I think it's about balance, but it's about entry. Yeah. I think a wine needs to talk you know, it, uh, to, to your, um, to your, your mental engagement, uh, not, not just make you feel full and, and, uh, and, yeah. and, and it's not just the effect of the drug. I think it's, it's, it's how you you know, how, you, what, what kind of other level of energy you can get out of that experience. Okay. And one thing I noticed with the, with the wines and with the, the Jack journal, there's a sort of, there's a design the, um, con continuity, if you like, between the two. And it, it's, it's a very much of a personal brand. There's a lot of storytelling, on, the, on even on the labels. You know, that idea of the movable feast or over the moon. Then producing a journal, which is, again, about stories. It's about, you know, reflections of our time. What, what's, what's your sort of thoughts about how, how their stories are, are going through all of these projects, if you like? If I'm understanding you correctly, there's sort of two things. The, the one is the um, a sort of the aesthetic continuum, um, yeah. which which is a, a sort of a, a very specific uh, design. Uh, um, it's an identity. Aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It's um, and and that I can explain very easily. Um, this the second part, which is a little bit more complex, which is the idea of storytelling. Maybe start with the second one first because it's more difficult. But I, I, th I think um, stories are obviously uh, very important uh, to the way that we view the world. So I think um, what I have experienced in South Africa is that where you have um, societies whose stories have been destroyed through yeah. either colonialism, slavery, or apartheid, or a combination of the three, um, they lack inner self-confidence. For me, it's what I what I refer to really as more as more positive. I call it positive mythology. Um, so, what is a positive mythology? Well, the Bible is is, is a mythology. Um, the uh, you know the Nordic uh, myths is a type of mythology. The Greek mythologies. Um, any story that not only informs a society. Uh, uh, Robert the Bruce in Scotland is a positive mythology that gives identity, a positive identity to a, a, a people or, an, or a, um, a group. Uh, and then, and then, then there are layers uh, underneath that, like an onion, of, of other positive mythologies. And, but they're all informed by, by the societal mythology. 
So when you get right down to the kernel of a family mythology, uh, wherein your personal mythology is built up because of what people have told you uh, about who they are being your family and also who your grandparents were mm -hmm. and how your grandparents might have got where they got to, which has led to where you are. You, you, you build up these, these layers of, of yourself and that gives you this, this positive mythology. It gives you this self-confidence. It, it allows you to um, be able to be generous and it allows you to uh, be able to see the world um, uh, from a from a confident perspective, as as opposed to um, not knowing where you're from, not knowing what you can be good at, and yeah. therefore not being able to believe in your own um, worth and your own abilities, your own inner magic. And and what what hap what I mean what happened in South Africa um, was that when Dutch arrived, they, uh, you know, the, the labor was needed on the farms. We, we had a thing called the Freeburger um, movement where people from Germany and, and, and at, at one stage France, but of course Holland as well, were given free land as long as they farmed. But of course, you know, hostile territory, um, very little infrastructure, very bad communication. Remember, the Dutch East India Company were not a government. They weren't interested in infrastructure. They were, they were interested in, in plunder and profit. Um, they were they were the first capitalist boss uh, for for you know um, you know the first company in which tra uh, shares were ever traded. So it kind of <laughs> have led to the slight implosion we're seeing today in in a weird funny way. But to to get labour um, and it coincided with the fact that they were plundering the Javanese archipelago. The first thing they did was they would go into an island, one of one of a thousand islands that they were after the spices of, and they would support the weaker family, and they would take the stronger family, and they would enslave them and take them to the Cape. So what happened is that when these guys arrived in the Cape, families were split up. They, they were, their um, uh, Arabic Muslim Javanese names were, were taken away from them. They were given names. So if you were um, arrived and was sold in January, your surname was January. You, you, you were stripped of your identity. Yeah, yeah. Families were split up. Husbands of wives were sent to different um, valleys. Children were split from their mothers. Um, and it was a way of subjugating and, and in, in instilling slavery and, and keeping slavery rebellions and all that kind of thing by destroying all the positive mythology. So within a couple of um, cent um, generations, there were no stories left to tell people. Um, and 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 we are still seeing the negative impact of that today. So I think for me, um, stories are the essence of what makes us. Uh, whether it is a creation myth story, or whether it's the story that you tell your kids about the fact that your grandfather once was a member of the British Parliament, or whatever the case might be, um, that, that that those things are essential to who we are. They become our reality. So okay. stories, I think, yeah, I mean, it's a long-winded way, but they are fascinating and very important to everyone. That's a brilliant answer. So, and on the visual side, I suppose you... Well, my, my father is an architect. Yes. And I think was uh, very influenced by modern, the, the modern movement. So Le Corbusier, Frank Lloyd Wright, Mies van der Rohe, um, less is more, clean yeah. lines... Um, looking a lot at negative space from an architectural perspective, which is the space between buildings, yes, or the space between rooms, and um, yeah, so I, I think, and well, and, and also very influenced by the likes of Alva Alto um, and the Scandinavian architects, Danish particularly. So I grew up in a very architectural aesthetic, and I think that has definitely influenced the way that I like to see magazines look. I, yeah. it's, that's the way I, I like to see websites look. It's the, it's the way I like to see homes and, and hotel lobbies look. And it's the way I love to see labels look. But of course, the, the, the journal is online, but it's not in print. And what's happened in South Africa? I mean, we all know what's happened around the world, but let's just zoom in on South Africa because it seems to have been a bit of a catastrophe across many levels. Can you talk a little bit about what you've experienced and what the tribulations have been and what the triumphs have been, if there are any? Yeah, so I, it's, it's, uh, 
she it's it's a it's been a spiritual and a psychological obstacle course um this lockdown period how jack journal landed up not being printed was that we well first of all we struggled to find a printer anywhere in the world that could print uh carbon neutrally okay. so you know the whole the whole uh push i mean I, we believe brands must stand for something we believe that consumers should use their consumer dollar or their consumer currency to m help make change and that consumers should only purchase brands that stand for something good yeah um or stand for something that they believe in and uh, i think uh, brands need to have an authentic voice um and and bruce jack and is is a is a brand with an authentic voice and one of the things we believe in is not only to be as environmentally friendly as possible which is impossible and be capitalist really you always the environment is always going to suffer it's just the way it is um but uh but to to then pour as much of your um, earnings as you possibly can afford back into uh, environmental rejuvenation so th this this for me as as sort of a i don't know more choleric type of person mm -hmm. makes a lot more sense to be able to say okay well you know what we're going to sell a bottle of wine we're going to make 10p you know let's let's spend 5p but cleaning cleaning the ocean let's either give it to somebody who, who can do it more effectively or or do something ourselves and use that as a way of, of involving our community our, our consumer um because i think the consumer who consumes bruce jack is is a little bit more of a thoughtful consumer and we see that in the comments that we get all the time from consumers i mean obviously they're people who just drink it because it looks nice and tastes nice but i think as soon as you engage with the brand you're engaging with it because of the values that the brand yeah. stands for so we eventually found one weirdly and completely coincidentally in Düsseldorf, which is of course where provine was going to be so we said okay well let us then as late as possible print jack journal and get it delivered to the hotel the day before provine starts so of course provine was cancelled and with that um you know it didn't make sense to to print the yeah. magazine in this okay. and then and then of course the whole COVID 19 um uh sort of roller coaster of emotions took over and uh it it, it just wasn't for me appropriate um to to now print something that really had no relevance to the the fluid reality that we were experiencing, the angst that we were caught up in. Um, I think as that angst settled and as we became more and more um, used to the, uh, the, the confusion, I, I think is a weird way of putting it, but, mm -hmm. but one sort of did, uh, I, I then found myself going back to Jack Journal and I normally hate reading A, what I've written and I can almost never read what I've read before very very i mean uh, you know fiesta the sun also rises by Ernest Hemingway is a rare example of a book that i i've gone back to 30 years later and have been able to read it but but generally it just seems a waste of time so for me to go back i, I went back with a little bit of trepidation and i i opened the first page and i read quite solidly for three hours every single word and i suddenly realized how um, amazing it was and that it actually had relevance even in no, it was conceived and 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 published um, produced in in a very different reality mm -hmm. three months ago from where we are today but there was still a, there was an underlying current of relevance um, that actually m made sense uh, even the little intro on the first page talks about the fact that if you know if we don't take care of the world um you know we are we are going to be uh yeah. we, we're going to suffer and and that could come in all sorts of forms so i think there is a link between the environment and what we're seeing i, I know that's slightly ethereal thinking but for me the 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 it was such an enjoyable publication which surprised me i mean shocked me actually that i i, I enjoyed it so much and got so much joy like nourishment from it actually that i, I thought geez i've got to publish this online I'm yeah. not going to wait until publishers can open up again and let's just get it out there. And also the contributors like yourself who put so much energy and effort into that deserve their thoughts grappled with and their words read um, and, and, and deserve to be able to teach. And, and I think the fact that it doesn't say the word virus or Corona is probably quite a relief at this stage in the game.
so, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah that, that's kind of the, that's the decision we came to, to push this forward. But it, what it does do is it, 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 it also allows us to maybe squeeze in another volume before the end of the year, which I'm quite excited about. And are you, um, are you yet out of the woods in terms of the wine business in South Africa? Are you, are you shipping? Are you selling wine? Is anything happening or is it all still locked down or shut down more in your case? Yeah, completely shut down. So we're the only wine um, producing country in the world that is not allowed to export. And we're one of only, I think, four countries in the world that have uh, some form of alcohol ban in place. Ours is a complete uh, blanket ban. You're not allowed to put a case of wine in the boot of your car. If you get pulled over, you will go to jail. So there's no distribution of alcohol. There's no sale of alcohol in any form. I mean, through any channel. And there's certainly no export. So this has uh, been absolutely devastating financially for the industry. We were allowed to export for a, for a week during the initial lockdown phase. And then a truck on the way to the harbor was hijacked. And that caused, which, which really boggles the mind, that, that, that caused the whole industry to be locked down again. So I think we've had a, a very different experience from any other uh, wine producing countries. Uh, look, I mean, the World Health Organization has lauded South Africa's reaction. Uh, we know that as we are, you guys are heading into spring, we're heading into autumn and winter. Mm. And all indications are that the virus uh, will prefer this environment to spread around. And we certainly don't have the uh, hospital uh, capacity or, or the medical personnel capacity to be able to deal with a virus that would take hold in a country like this. It would be absolutely devastating. It would be a carnage. So I'm in favor of that. I'm also actually in favor of keeping alcohol off the streets in South Africa. What we don't need is our hospitals clogged up with alcohol related accidents road accidents or, or whatever you know we, we do have a terrible uh, road fatality record primarily because of fairly weak policing mm. and, and i think we we are in a situation in south africa where the very difficult decision has had to be made by those in charge of, of how one grapples with the medical emergency and the medical threat without completely creating a civil unrest situation through poverty and through hunger. I'm not sure <laughs> they've got that right because there's some low-hanging fruit which one, one should really engage with. Um, one of them is wine exports. It doesn't really mean that wine is, uh, alcohol is going to come into the, the local market at all and it would allow us to bring in foreign revenue, it would allow us to bring in excise yeah. of duty the fiscus desperately needs look i mean south africa is quite a, in quite an interesting place we are financially on our knees anyway because of the zuma years so uh zuma with a, a, an indian family called the guptas managed to steal what people uh, assume is somewhere between 800 billion and a trillion rand from the fiscus it didn't all go to them it was just the whole graft situation that was involved in that process almost every element of society came under some level of destruction including right. the police and uh, really it, it's uh, if it wasn't for journalists like yourself um, who very bravely have stood up and have continued to tell the truth with a strong constitution which we do have and our court system, South Africa would be destroyed by now. So the court institution and the, and the journalistic freedom that we have yeah. are the two things that have held it all together. So we're really on our knees financially. And uh, I think we, need a, we probably need a trillion rand to be able to feed people and hold the integrity of the lockdown. And we only have 130 billion to play with. That's what we can take out of the budget the rest we're going to have to go to imf world bank the chinese you know whoever's out there yeah. who we can can try and do a deal with so for me that's you know i mean you know my business has been absolutely hammered we're looking at staff are not paid their normal salary we're looking at all sorts of levels we have applied to government for relief uh we haven't heard a word um so the um, unemployment fund which is there has 100 billion rand in it to for just for, for uh, circumstances just like this have just been I suppose inundated with requests and have uh, somewhat imploded under the under that and have I've been unable to to really fulfill their mandate the money hasn't trickled down as a result to those people who really needed it the most I'm hopeful that that will change as as things get up but it's just another example of 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 poor 
capacity in our institutions. Uh, I mean, the other weird thing is that for people who are starving, uh, often piecemeal workers, people who work from week to week, they haven't, you know, had money. Their savings have run out weeks ago. They don't even have money for electricity. So if you give them a food parcel, they can't cook the food. And so it's really, it's, it's come down to sort of desperate soup kitchen sort of environment yeah. where we drive a, a pickup or we call it a bucky into a township with a big um, plastic bin of soup on the back and we ladle out soup and, and try and get everybody an apple. So, so you're and doing this of, now? A piece of the bread. Is, is this falling under the Head Start Trust or is this just under your own? Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? So the Head Start Trust uh, is a trust that uh, we have been operational for about 15 years in the last five years we focused always on primary school education right from the very beginning for reasons i won't go into very boring but necessary in south africa and um and and the last five years we focused on music education so what i was talking about earlier about this lack of positive mythology they are positive mythology factories i call them that can create short-term positive mythologies in communities where that has been destroyed one of them is sport so if you go on and play rugby for the Springboks, um, everybody in your suburb uh, is uplifted through that process or your town. And the other one is the church. Church is, is, is a positive mythology factory, whether it's the, the mosque or the Christian churches or the Hindu temples. Um, they, they, they provide a veneer of, of positivity that allows people to be confident. And the third one, which is in all of us, is music. So we are campaigning for music to be um, included as in the curriculum of all schools across South Africa and for the government to, to you know, what money there is available, of course, to focus on getting music teachers into schools so that kids have the opportunity to learn how to read and write music. Yeah. And we know that that increases everything else, their maths and, yeah. and language skills. And obviously with COVID-19 and all the schools being closed, we took that trust um, which employs teachers and buys musical instruments, blah, blah. And we said, okay, food relief. So we have comp we, we changed the, we got all the trustees to agree and we changed the, the, the focus of it for this period. And our real role is to provide a bridge between the haves, whether they are overseas in places like Canada or the UK or Holland, and the have nots, which are the people who are starving in our poor rural areas, which have been forgotten about. Um, primary in a lot of cases the municipalities are mal have malfunctioned for years so you can't give the municipalities money and expect that to somehow miraculously now become food parcels um, you actually have to work with people who are already working in the community people who are working in um, aftercare facilities or um, uh, women who are at risk uh, women who, who are beaten up by their husband that there are a lot of these community centers where which are, which in these little uh, villages um, and you work with them, you work through the churches who have communities and know who in their community uh, is the poorest and, and, and most at risk. Uh, you work with already established soup kitchens who have been doing this anyway. So we do four main things. We, we, we buy food from partners, like we as a supermarket. We partner with, with the, uh, in Cape Town. We go buy bulk from them at very good prices. We bring it in using our vehicles and our personnel. Um, and we distribute directly to soup, soup kitchens to people who are making up food parcels in these poor rural areas. And the other thing is we are establishing our own soup kitchen. The X goes into production next week for the first time. So we've had to go and purchase our own equipment. And that's going to be in, in the hall of the Dutch Reformed Church in Napier. Um, we've had to buy our own gas and get the electricity up and running, get the kitchen back up and running. And we're going to really be focusing on, on the, the guys that fall through the cracks a lot of foreign nationals fall in that category or people that just uh, haven't applied for a grant or don't know how to apply for a grant. South Africans are just find the whole process too difficult yeah. um, and aren't getting any money and have lost their jobs, lost their income and have run out of food. Stranded. And then the other thing we're going to be doing is, is uh, feeding uh, the children who we've been teaching anyway for the last five years at the, at the uh, primary school. We are going in there and they get fed on a Tuesday and a Thursday by the Department of Education, but the Department of Education can't pay for any more than that. And we're going to try and feed them on the Monday and the Friday so that um, they've got food either side of the weekend.
Wow. So it's quite comprehensive, really. You know, you have to work within a, um, a community. You have to allow the community to take ownership of it. And uh, to a certain extent, you can't be a control freak about this. You, you, need, uh, you, you need collaboration and you need to work with the right people. Now, it's taken us a while to, to make sure that we're comfortable, that we're aligned, that food isn't going to places because of a political agenda. Like yeah. you're only going to get food if you promise to vote for me next year. It's another reason why municipalities are problematic. We're working directly with community workers, churches, farmers yeah. who are already doing it in areas. And so we're supplying this whole Southern Cape region. So it's Strace by it's Bredarsdorp, it's Napier, uh, Elam, and we're going to be moving um, also into an area called Stanford. Um, there's another... There's another guy I've been talking to there to try and support them. So yeah, it's 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 become a, a little bit of a, a military operation, but at the same time, you know, um, is that saying that we've grown up with uh, noblesse oblige, which roughly translated means to those who have been given a lot, much is expected. And it's something that I grew up with all my life and opportunity to put into action. Very good, very good. And just a very last word quite quickly. Um, do you see a way out of this? Any way out of this? Are, are there thoughts on the horizon of, you know, a route to the future, if you like, or shaping the future? Because every, I mean, this is a problem all over the world now. People are trying to think what's on the other side of this. And from your perspective, any thoughts? I mean, one interesting perspective has been the change in people of how we view things. I mean, I think yeah, Nick, I mean, it's, I agree. It, it, it's, it's almost um, facile to say that that things are changed and will always remain changed. Um, I hope that people will see past um, the greed that has ruined the planet. And that, um, that, that I just hope that there, and I will, and I sort of, I would like to focus people's attention on, on having, a, having a look at this crisis that we have successfully, in most cases, and collaboratively combated on all sorts of levels from a community and civil society perspective all the way up to you know um, uh, logistic companies and high levels of government um, that, that this is an opportunity to remove the actors from politics and to ensure that we only put leaders in yeah. politics because politics is fraught it's a, there's a disease of actors and that's why there's been so many poor decisions taken that's the first thing so that it galvanizes the thought process of people who are voting that like am i voting for somebody who can handle a crisis and who actually i believe in when thing when the going gets tough or am i voting for a good looking guy who talks well and actually has spineless uh i think that's the first thing and then and then and then to be able to see this crisis as just a bigger crisis of our environment and how we need to change how do we we, we okay. desperately need to rejuvenate the balance uh, in okay. nature to be able to that is really the buffer between these kind of catastrophes and and us being able to live in harmony with with all organisms including viruses well that's a fantastic place to to finish so thank you very much well thank you for your time i really appreciate it